Chapel, you may have a seat. Thank you for joining us for worship this morning. A particular welcome to our fathers, the fathers in the room, as we remember, as we celebrate Father's Day. You know, that's that's a very obvious figure metaphor that's used throughout Scripture of the relationship to uh, that we have with God as children of God. We we call Him Father, and I think that's so apt given the uh, significance, the leadership, the spiritual responsibility of fathers. That that's a uh, a metaphor we use often. So thank you to the fathers in the room that are leading their families in spiritual things, and welcome to Riverwood this morning. As you came in this morning, you got a bulletin, a couple things I'd like to highlight uh, there. Next Sunday, 
Next Sunday is Worship on the Lawn, June 26th at 10 a.m. So if you come at this time next week, uh, we're going to be well into the service. So 10 a.m. next Sunday morning, we do this once a year. We'll gather together on the front lawn for worship, and we'll be doing baptisms next Sunday as well. So if you'd like to be baptized, uh, today's the deadline for registering. So you can register today, use the information card, or you can do it online. But we have to know today so we can take care of everything before next week if you'd like to be baptized. Uh, today as well is a inReach food ministry. We have these tags out there like these. Uh, this is a, a program, a ministry that we have for those within Riverwood that need help with their groceries. So if you want to take part in that, after the service, grab one of the tags, buy whatever's on it, and bring it back next week, and we'll distribute it within the Riverwood family. And of course, this week, obviously something very special going on, as you can tell by, oh, there we go, thank you, as you can tell by what, what the building looks like, Camp Riverwood is, starts tomorrow night. If you haven't registered your children, your child yet, you can do that today at the counter as well or online, if you, even though it starts tomorrow. If you get them registered today, that just helps out, so we encourage you to, uh, to consider doing that before tomorrow. About a year and a half ago, we uh, published a booklet. We have copies of them still in the foyer called our 2020 Focus. Four main areas that we want to focus on for five years, starting in 2015 through 2020, focusing on these, these four main areas for five years. Leadership development within Riverwood, discipleship within Riverwood, outreach to our communities around us, and, and stewardship. And the three primary uh, initiatives under stewardship deal with individual stewardship uh, of our personal finances and resources, corporate stewardship of finances through debt elimination, and the future stewardship of ministry growth through expanding our facilities here and, and doing so debt-free. And of course, this past year, we celebrated the accomplishing the one of those that was a very specific goal is to become uh, debt-free, to eliminate our debt. And we have done that. And so for the coming years as well, we'll continue to focus just on discipleship as it relates to stewardship. And it has obviously a lot of impact on how we handle our finances, but stewardship means, well, of all of our resources, our times, our skills, our talents, those kind of things. And so we're, we're going to be emphasizing that uh, throughout the coming years. Specifically this summer, we're talking, though, about a, uh, uh, launching a building campaign this fall and where we're going with that. Two weeks ago, Cole, Pastor Cole stood up here and talked about, uh, gave a report on the elders going into all the life groups and reporting on where we're heading this fall, and, and the response was overwhelmingly positive. So it, a lot of good momentum in that area. But in all areas of discipleship and stewardship, particularly this, we want to make sure that it's, that it's really undergirded, bathed, whatever metaphor there you want to use as well, in prayer and the spiritual aspect of it. So we're, we're also uh, creating a spiritual emphasis committee, and we're calling it a task force, just to keep reminding ourselves of, of the spiritual aspect of this undertaking. And Pastor Johnny is going to be leading that. And one of the practical things we're going to do in the next couple of weeks, we're going to be, start sending out a weekly prayer update, just a, a few bullet points that we'll send out every week regarding the building campaign, but also these other emphases, these other areas that we're focused on for the next, uh, well, now three and a half years as well. So um, thanks for being part of that and praying for us as we, uh, as we try corporately to be stewards of all the resources God has given us. Thanks. We gather in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Please pray with me. Holy Spirit of God, grant unity in your church called Riverwood, that we who call ourselves brothers and sisters in Christ may sense and understand each other's needs and share your grace with each other. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. his children 
There is only one Emmanuel God is with us There is only one Whose majesty is unending There is only one The King of kings never failing All, all the rise And the name Of our Savior Who is worthy You are worthy There is only sound of your name Jesus there is power there is power at the sound of your name Jesus there is power there is power at the sound
Please remain standing to hear the word of God found in Psalm 138. I will praise you, Lord, with all my heart. Before the gods, I will sing your praise. I will bow down toward your holy temple and will praise your name for your unfailing love and your faithfulness. For you have so exalted your solemn decree that it surpasses your fame. When I called, you answered me. You greatly emboldened me. May all the kings of the earth praise you, Lord, when they hear what you have decreed. May they sing of the ways of the Lord, for the glory of the Lord is great. Though the Lord is exalted, he looks kindly on the lowly. Though lofty, he sees them from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. You stretch out your hand against the anger of my foes. With your right hand, you save me. The Lord will vindicate me. Your love, Lord, endures forever. strength within the sorrow there is beauty in our tears and you meet us in our morning with a love that casts out fear you are working in our waiting sanctifying us when beyond our understanding you're teaching us to trust your plans are still to prosper you have not forgotten us you're with us in the fire and the flood faithful for it
Pray with me, please. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord God, that you are sovereign over us. That you are faithful forever. That you're with us in the fire and the flood, in the hard times of our life. You are there. You are unchanging, ever loving, ever gracious to us, Lord. Your word tells us, Lord, that you are the same from ages past to today to forevermore, Lord. And we can trust in your sovereignty over our lives. Father, no matter what we're going through today, help us to rest in you. Help us to see you as being in control of our circumstances. And give us the peace and assurance that allows us to rest in you. We thank you for that, Lord. Help us to embrace you today in your word. As we hear it, allow it to change our lives. Allow us to reflect upon it, Lord. And let the Holy Spirit conform us into your image. Lord, I thank you. And Father, as we do on a weekly basis, Lord, we lift up missionaries that we support. This morning, Lord, we lift up Emily Baunhauer. Lord, in South Asia, Father, as she's preparing to uh, finish out her mission term there, Lord, we just pray for, for her to finish well, for her to see the the fruit of her labor, Lord, for the students that she's been ministering to to continue to serve you, to look for you, to grow in you, Father, to advance their faith in you. Lord, honor her time. Bless her efforts, Lord. And Father, we ask for you to bless our efforts this week here at Riverwood as we put on camp and Camp Extreme. Lord, I ask for grace, for all the participants, for all the helpers, from the leaders of the crafts to the food to the Bible teachers to the worship ministry team. Lord, give us the power. Give us the strength to minister out of your ability that you give us. And draw the kids to you, Lord. Draw adults to you. Lord, that you will be glorified. Just as we sang in that song, Lord, that you get the glory for all our efforts. So, Father, we lay them before you and ask for you to be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. You can go ahead and have a seat. We begin each worship service each week by reminding ourselves that we gather in the name of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, one God, three persons who live in perfect unity. And this is the image in which we are created. And God invites us into that perfect unity to become one with him. He doesn't just call us servants. He he calls us friends. He invites us in. The same fellowship that he enjoys around the throne, Father, Son, and Spirit, he says, come, my children, be part of this. And it's this vision that caused Paul to write, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father, and we join with him in some way at the right hand of the Father also. and We are blessed beyond measure. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who has blessed us 
us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in the heavenly places Let's sing that together Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. in Christ that we should be holy, adopted as his sons and daughters, redemption through the blood of the Savior, forgiveness from our sins, according to the riches of grace that he lavished on us. Good morning. If you've had your TV at on at all this week, you've uh, seen over and over again all that's been going on down in Orlando with the terrorist attack, and 
I may be outdated now, but 49 people killed and 53 injured. And just as we think about all the people affected by that, um, we just wanted to start this morning with a time of prayer, um, just to pray for, for everyone involved um, and all who are surrounding. So this is what we're going to do. Why don't we take just a minute or two and, and just pray silently, offer up your own uh, prayer to the Lord, and then, and then Lon and I will pray as well. So let's pray. Father, we began this time together with a song that uh, declared the power in the name of your Son, Jesus. And we know that that power becomes even so much more effective when coupled with your grace. And so we ask for the power of the name of Jesus and your grace when we think of situations that took place in one of our cities this past week. I pray for ourselves first that, that you remind us of the power of your name and your grace and forgive us when we tend to look at people and label them by a lifestyle as we may be tempted to do of the victims or even label the perpetrator by his religion. Give us eyes to see how you see people created in your image needing your grace. We pray to prayer for ourselves that you would give us eyes to recognize the needs within our own community, within each other, and then meet those needs. And so we, we pray that for Orlando, for all of those involved as well, that your church there would respond with the love of Christ and would be ambassadors of peace, would be ambassadors of the power of your son's name, would be ambassadors of your grace. May you Rise up your church. May those who enjoy the power of Christ's name, those who have enjoyed your grace, have eyes to see. Put us in contact with those who are suffering, those who are mourning, those who are angry. Allow us to be ambassadors. Allow your church to be ambassadors of grace and peace and comfort. God, your word says you're the God of all comfort, and so we know in a situation like this, if there's comfort to be found, it's found in you. And Lord, we know you, your people are all over uh, this country, and Lord, our prayer is that believers will rise up in Orlando and around to be your hands and feet to those who are hurting. God, our prayers, your gospel would go forth in the midst of this, um, that there might be a new openness to the truth of Jesus Christ. Lord, we sang that um, even what the enemy means for evil, you can turn it for good. And so our prayer is for that out of this situation. And Lord, your son called us to pray for our enemies, and so we do that too. Um, Lord, no one's outside the power of your reach. Uh, even the Apostle Paul was <laughs> once killing Christians and you reached him. And uh, so, Lord, would you turn the hearts of those who, who hate us, our enemies, would you draw them to yourself? Uh, we pray for them. Um, Lord, we uh, 
are grateful we can turn to you in moments like this, knowing that you hear our prayers and you respond to them. Uh, We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. There's a lot of brokenness in the world. Uh, We see it all around us. Um, I mean, we see it on the news and terrorist attacks, but we don't have to look that far. We see the brokenness of this world a lot closer to home than that. We see broken marriages, and we see child abuse. Uh, We hear of sex trafficking. I mean, there's over and over again examples of how brokenness is out there, and then all we have to do is turn inward and realize the brokenness isn't out there only. It's also in each of us. And when we struggle with envy or we struggle with greed or pride, realize, well, the brokenness is in each of us as well. And whenever our lives sort of intersect with the brokenness of this world, always what it leaves in its wake is devastation. It leaves tragedy. And, uh, you know, that's what always happens. So maybe, maybe it might be that you lost somebody, or it might be you're without a job, or it could be a health thing that you're struggling with. And in moments of tragedy... Uh, there's not much that's very helpful. Lots of people turn to some sort of substance, drugs or alcohol or pornography or something, and then hope that the high of those experiences can sort of numb the pain of the tragedy. And um, when the high wears off, we realize it it didn't. Some try to escape into entertainment and think, man, maybe I can kind of get away from the pain, but once that's over, it didn't really deal with the, the pain that was there. The only earthly thing that's really helpful at all, and I say earthly thing, in in moments of tragedy is really a friend, is a friend who's there to sort of walk with you through that tragedy and help you come out on the other side. A friend, a true friend. And if you were with us last week, we're spending two weeks talking about true friendship, Uh, This summer, we're going through the book of Proverbs, and um, one of the themes Solomon keeps coming over and over again to is the theme of friendship. And so we thought we'd take these two weeks and talk about, well, what is a true friend? Um, As Cole shared last week, each of us have sort of an innate desire for friendship, an innate capacity for relationship with other people, and a desire to connect deeply with others. Um, We're made in God's image. That's part of who God is. He gave that to us when he created us. And yet, there is a real decline. Even though we're more connected to people than ever, there's a real decline in friendships. So, do you have a close friend? Do you have somebody who's uh, in your inner circle? Somebody who's sort of close, a true friend to you. I read a disturbing statistic this week about sort of the decline of friendships. In 1985, 10% of Americans said they have no close friend, no one in here. And fast forward 30 years, now that statistic's up to 25%. One in four of us say there's nobody in this inner circle. And even those of us who say that we have somebody in this circle, some of us are reaching pretty far back. We're thinking back to a college roommate or, or maybe someone that we, we, we uh, raised our kids with. And we have to reach back 10 years or more to somebody who we could call a close friend. We're in a friendship crisis. Certainly in our culture we are, but, but even most of us in this room, if we were to look at our circle and say, who's in this circle? Who's that close friend to me? We'd have to say, either there's not as many as we'd like to think or they're not as deep as we'd like to think. Um, we're in a friendship crisis. And if we've been created with this sort of capacity and desire for close friendships and they're not there, that leaves us lonely. And most of us probably misdiagnose our loneliness. Certainly we're not lonely. We're so busy. We have all these people around us. But deep inside, we're actually lonely. And so we've been looking at what does 
God have to say about a true friend? And we've been sort of looking at it from two different angles. One, we've been saying, well, who are the friends in your life? Who do you have around you? Are your friends the true friends that, that God describes? That's sort of an outward look. We've also been sort of looking inwardly and saying, well, am I a true friend to those around me? Do I display these characteristics as well? So we've been looking at it from both, both directions. And so throughout Proverbs, if you look at all the verses that talk about friendship, there's sort of seven different characteristics that they boil down to. And last week, Cole touched on the first three. Here they are. Uh, a true friend has authentic motives. They're not out to use you. They're not just trying to get something for you, from you. A true friend loves you for you. A true friend possesses godly character. A true friend pushes you towards Christ, not, not away from him. And then a true friend speaks honestly. The reality is lots of people can see your blind spots, can see my blind spots, but a true friend is the one who will actually speak up and tell you about your blind spots. So if you want to hear more about those, you'll have to go online and, and watch and listen to last week's message. Uh, our task for this morning is to, to hit the other four that the book of Proverbs sort of highlights for us. But then I don't want us to just stop there. I want us to then ask, well, now what? Okay, we've seen these seven characteristics. What, what should we do with them? All right, so let's, let's look at the next characteristic. And we've actually already hit on this one a little bit this morning. And uh, that is that a true friend shows deep commitment and constancy. Solomon says it this way, Proverbs 18, 24. A man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Let's take this apart a second. He, he says there are, there are a man, there's a man of many companions. You look at that word companions, it literally means someone who's next to you. Someone who's of close proximity. This would be an associate or, or some sort of acquaintance. Just a superficial friend. And Solomon says when it comes to friendship, quality matters a lot more than quantity. He says a man of many acquaintances may come to ruin. Now this doesn't mean that having a lot of acquaintances is a bad thing. But what he's saying is when trouble comes, when adversity takes place, Acquaintances will be of no help to you. I mean, think about the culture this was written in. This was a culture before the Bill of Rights. This was a culture before insurance. This is a culture before the legal system we have today that actually helps you when you go through trouble. So when the bottom fell out, the only place you had to go for help was your friends. And Solomon says, acquaintances, when, when trouble comes your way, they'll be of no value to you. The one who will be of value to you, is, he says, is a friend. And this is a very different word. This is literally a treasured one, a loved one, a buddy. We might say a pal, someone who's more than an acquaintance. And Solomon says, this person is, will stick closer than a brother. He makes a comparison with blood relatives. In, in that culture, in ours as well, relatives are sort of obligated to help you when you're in trouble, right? Solomon says, a friend? A friend doesn't have to like a relative. A relative has to help you. A friend wants to help you. So that's what a friend is. A friend is so committed to you. Uh, Proverbs 17, 17 says it this way. A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. The key word is all times. You know, lots of people are there when things are going well, but a friend is one when, when, the, when the hard things come, they don't run away, they run towards you. That's deep commitment. Uh, there's a story that came out of Vietnam, uh, probably similar to a scene that you, you saw in Forrest Gump or something like that, but, but it, war is happening, and um, in sort of the, the fray of all of it, the, the two sides sort of separate, and the Viet Cong go off into the bushes that side, and the American troops kind of off into the bushes on this side, and in the middle is sort of no man's land. And one of the American soldiers goes down in the middle of no man's land, and he's just left for dead. Well, Tommy, his friend, is on, on the American side and says, Sarge, I've got to go out and get him. And the sergeant knows that I mean, that's suicide. 
You don't go out into no man's land and live to tell about it. So he says, no, I'm not losing another guy. You cannot go out there. But, but Tommy says, no, I've got to go. And, and disobeying orders, he crawls out through no man's land, grabs his friend and pulls him back. And when he gets, he's, he's dead. And in the process, Tommy gets all shot up and he's probably going to die too. And the sergeant says, see, I told you it wasn't worth it. And Tommy looks at him and says, it, it was worth it. Because when I got out to there to him, he was still alive. And he looked at me and he said, Tommy, I knew you'd come. That's the kind of friendship Solomon's talking about. That sort of deep commitment. You can't keep this kind of friend away. Friend at all times. If a friend when you get the promotion, a friend when you have the baby, but also a friend when cancer hits and when you have the accident. So do you have any friends like this in your life? Friends that run towards you when trouble comes. If you want to have fun with this, tonight at about 2 a.m., try calling your friends. The ones who pick up, they're the ones in this circle with you. But then how are you at being this sort of friend? Is there anyone in your life where if they were to call you right now, you would clear your calendar for the next week? To those people, you're that kind of friend, those who you do that for. I found this quote in my notes. I'm not sure exactly where it came from, but I like what it says about friendship. It says, the main business of friendship is to sustain and make bearable each other's burdens. We may do more of that as friends than we do anything else. Getting through the tough times, offering encouragement when the other desperately needs it, shoring each other up to face the unfairness of existence. The main work of friendship consists of such homely tasks. You think of the song, that's what friends are for. For good times, for bad times, I'll be by your side forevermore. True friends shows deep commitment, constancy. Uh, the next is a little more basic, a little simpler to grasp. It's that a true friend keeps confidence. But this is equally crucial to a true friend. Uh, Proverbs eleven thirteen says it this way. Whoever goes about slandering reveals secrets, but he who is trustworthy in spirit keeps a thing covered. Now, we've probably all been on the receiving end of this one, right? You've, you've told something to one of your friends in confidence, but it didn't stay with them. They, they shared it with other people. I can still remember I was in seventh grade, and I told my friend Brian Dernick that I thought Paige Hannon was cute. And I didn't want anyone else to know, and most of all, I didn't want Paige Hannon to know. But the next day at school, I was horrified. And you can tell I can still remember it. <laughs> um... Do you think Brian stayed in my inner circle of friends? No. And this sort of thing happens all the time. It's not just a part of middle school romance. Uh, friends, within the safety of their friendship, share things that they want kept between them, not shared with anyone else. The quickest way to lose a close friend is to, to share something they share with you with other people. So why in the world would anyone do it? We've probably all done it too. Why would we do that? It's really tempting because knowledge is power. And so when people are talking about something, if we know something about that, it's really tempting to, to bring that into the conversation. Proverbs twenty twenty two says, the words of a whisperer are like delicious morsels. I mean, who doesn't like to pass out delicious morsels, right? It makes you pretty popular sometimes. Solomon says, no, keep it covered. If you keep it covered, you'll be a trustworthy friend. I heard a story about Adele, you know, the singer, that as she was sort of becoming famous, she really wanted to sort of discern who are her friends and who aren't her friends. And there were these three gals specifically. And so she decided when she broke up with her boyfriend to give each one a different version of the story so that when it got leaked out, she would know which of the friends had betrayed her. I think it's genius. She, she knows that a true friend keeps confidence. So do you have anyone in your life that you know, they're a vault. You tell them something and it's going to go no further. 
Do you do that for your friends? Keep your mouth shut. Uh, This next one needs a little bit more explanation, and that is that a true friend is appropriately dependent. Now, this one came uh, from looking at two different Proverbs, putting them next to each other, and realizing that the, what Solomon is actually calling us to is the balance right in the middle. I'll show you the two Proverbs. Uh, the first is 18.1. He says, Whoever isolates himself seeks his own desire. He breaks out against all sound judgment. And the other is Proverbs 25.17. Let your foot... Be seldom in your neighbor's house, lest he have his fill of you and hate you. (laughs) He's talking about a spectrum here, right? On this far side of the spectrum, he's talking about someone who's completely independent. They're isolated. They're hard. They, They don't ever share needs with anyone. They have no need for any other human being. This is, um, what Simon and Garfunkel call, uh, the island, right? The rock. This is, uh, the Lone Ranger, if you have to put an animal to this person, this is a cat, you right? Cats don't need you. They, they, they could do well without you. I'm not really a cat person. I just offended all you cat people. But um, someone last service came up after. What do you have against cats? They're just independent. They're isolated, right? Um, but then he sort of swings all the way to the other side in this other proverb and says, equally bad is somebody who's codependent. They're so needy that they're annoying. You know, a relationship's supposed to be give and take. This person is all take and no give. If you have to put an animal to this person, this is a leech or a tick or something like that. They just suck life out of you. So Solomon says, these are both wrong. The, 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 The true friend is somebody in the middle, somebody who's appropriately dependent. They're dependent. They're They're not isolated. They, they actually need you. They'll tell you they need you. When they, they have something they need, they ask for help. They don't, they don't, it's give and take. It's like a ping pong game. It's back and forth. It's not all one-sided. Somebody who's appropriately dependent. Some of my deepest friendships have come uh, in doing house projects. When, when, when one or both of us have gotten into some sort of home project and realized we're way over our head. And so we go to each other and say, I need your help. And it's not just, hey, I need your help or I can't get this floor done. If, if it was only about the kitchen floor, then that would be manipulation. Uh, that'd be abuse. But it's, no, I need you. There's something in my life that I can't do on my own. I need your help. I need your friendship in my life. Softening. So each of us probably tend towards one side of this or the other, but wherever you are, whether you're uh, too independent or you're too needy, the the true friend is moving towards the middle, appropriately dependent. Uh, Maybe a different picture would help. Uh, Chuck Swindoll uses the picture of a bag of uh, marbles and a bag of grapes. Let's look at what he says. He says, you can choose to be a bag of marbles, independent, Hard, loud, unmarked, unaffected by others. Or you can be a bag of grapes, fragrant, soft, blending, mingling, flowing into one another's lives. Marbles are made to be counted and kept. But grapes are made to be bruised and used. Marbles scar and they clank, but grapes yield and cling. So do you have anyone in your life that you can depend on, that you've opened yourself up to and said, I need you. I I need to ask you for help. I need you in my life. But then how about you? Does anyone look to you and say, I can go to them. I can go to that person and ask for help, and I know they'll respond. A true friend is appropriately dependent. And then there's one more, and I saved this one for last on purpose. It's a true friend forgives. There's a Turkish proverb that says, he who seeks a faultless friend is friendless. There's no perfect friend. In fact, uh, eventually, every single one of your friends will hurt you. So if you and I don't learn this one, 
all of our friendships will eventually end, and we'll just go find new friendships. Uh, Solomon says it this way. Whoever covers an offense seeks love, but he who repeats a matter separates close friends. When an offense happens... And there are lots of ways friends hurt each other. I mean, we talked about, uh, I mean, a friend could tell something that you told them in private. They could tell it. That's a way you can be offended by a friend. Maybe your friend was angry and said something to you and it hurt your feelings or whatever. There are lots of ways friends hurt each other. But once an uh, offense happens, there's only two options. You can either, you can cover that offense, which means you can forgive it. You can decide to let it go. And Solomon says, when you do that, you seek love. You seek the restoration of that friendship. So you can cover that offense or you can repeat the matter. And this doesn't necessarily mean you keep repeating it over and over and over again. Even to repeat it once is to repeat it. It means to dwell on it. Someone hurts you, you can either forgive it or you can dwell on it. And if you dwell on it, for sure, your close friendship will be separated. Those are the only options. There's no sort of middle ground. Oh, let's just pretend it didn't happen. Let's try to go on as if if this never happened and we'll just pick up where we left off. That can't happen. Now, this sort of thing happens all the time. Um, Now, I put this last on purpose because look at the list of these seven things about a true friend. You can be an expert at the first six. You can have pure motives with your friends. You can have a godly character. You can speak honestly with someone. Uh, You can be so committed to that friend. You can keep confidence with them. You can be appropriately dependent. And your friend, they can also be a wizard at all six of them. But if in your friendship you can't get this last one, the forgiveness, that friendship will eventually end because we sin against each other. We can't help it. And so I've seen this sort of thing happen over and over again where two friends, things are going along, and then something happens. They hurt each other. And they don't figure out how to work through it. There's no forgiveness, so they think, that friend's the problem. I'll go find another friend. And they have sort of cyclical two-year friendships. The solution when someone hurts you isn't to go find someone else. If you don't ever want to be hurt by a friend, then your solution is to go become this independent, isolated, rock, island person. But we've already talked about the dangers of that. No, the solution is to learn to forgive. You don't need a new friend. You just need to learn how to forgive the friend who's hurt you. So to learn to let go, to overlook it, or as Solomon says, to cover that offense. Allow me to brag on my wife a little bit. Um, I shared this story uh, with a number of you. Um, but a, a few years back, a friend of hers, we'll call her Sally, um, uh, offended Jen. And um, Sally, the way it started is, Sally, when we started dating, Sally didn't approve of me. Can you believe it? <laughs> that wasn't necessarily her offense. Um, at first, it seemed sort of endearing right? That uh, is a protective friend. Who's this guy that's come into your life? But as, as Jen and I's relationship kept growing and it was getting more and more serious, Sally sort of never came around. In fact, it, was, it became pretty clear it didn't have as much to do with me as it had to do with the own sort of rela- her own relational things going on and not being willing to be excited for someone else. And it sort of came to a climax when at our engagement party, Sally just sort of stood in the corner, arms crossed, a big frown on her face. I mean, that's a big offense. I've seen friendships crumble for far less offenses than that. But over the course of the next six months while we were engaged, I saw Jen really do the work of forgiveness, of sort of saying, hey, that really hurt me, and and actually working through it, such that on our wedding day, she actually stood up as one of Jen's bridesmaids in support of us. And even to this day, they still talk on the phone weekly. That's the beauty of forgiveness. If when your friendship gets to that point where you've hurt each other, if you're able to work through that and forgive each other, what comes out on the other side is so much more beautiful than was even there at the beginning. But most of us, we get to that point and it's, all right, let's go find another friend. And we miss out on the depth and beauty that friendship can have if we'll 
do as a true friend does and forgive. A true friend forgives. So what do we do with all of this? Let's ask the, okay, now what question? Because that's a lot of information. I mean, man, Solomon, God through Solomon has a ton of wisdom to offer us about friendship. What friends to have, but then also how we can be a true friend. So what are we supposed to do with this? My guess is that all of us would love to have more people in this circle. We want to have more close friendships. Or with the friendships that we have, we'd love to go deeper with them. So one way we could go from here is to say, okay, well, we've all heard the phrase, to have good, uh, good friends, we have to be a good friend. So we could say, okay, the application from all of this is to go be a good friend. Solomon laid out how we're supposed to do that. Let's just go focus on that. Focus on being a good friend to everyone around us, and in the process, our friendships will grow deeper. Uh, You've heard what Dale Carnegie says. He says, you can make more friends in two months by being interested in other people than you can in two years by trying to get other people interested in you. So one way we could go from here is to say, okay, let's focus on being good friends to those around us. But I don't think that's actually what we should do. Because you could hear all of this, and you could take, okay, these seven things I need to do, and you could load them up on your back, and you could say, okay, I'm going to do this, and you could leave here and say, okay, I got a list of things I'm going to do, I'm going to do it, but it's just heavy. Who can do that? I think much better, there's a step before this, and that is to be a good friend, you have to experience the great friend. Jesus is the greatest friend you'll ever meet. So you and I aren't supposed to go and pursue a list of how to be a good friend. You and I are supposed to go and actually pursue and experience the friend that we already have. Because the more you and I experience Jesus' friendship, we'll be taught how to be a good friend. I mean, think of the characteristics we looked at this morning. A good friend is deeply committed to you. Well, who's been more committed to you than Jesus? Maybe you haven't thought about it in personal terms, but when you, when I was walking away from Jesus and stiff-arming him and saying, I want nothing to do with you, he came after me. He came after you. So committed, he paid the ultimate price. He gave his life for you. You will never meet a friend more committed to you. So as you experience afresh that commitment Jesus has towards you and your good, you'll learn how to give that to other people. A good friend, a true friend, keeps confidence. Well, Jesus will never take what you share with him, will never take what you give him, the junk in your life that you tell him about. He'll never use that and stab you in the back. In fact, Hebrews said, uh, the book of Hebrews says, Jesus is even now interceding on our behalf. Jesus is using his position to better us, not to harm us. So if you've ever experienced a safe friendship, Jesus is safer than that. Jesus is appropriately needy. That sounds a little weird to talk about Jesus that way, but he is. Jesus is willing to help you, but he's never going to be overbearing. He's never going to force himself on you. He's waiting, waiting for you and I to sort of turn and open up and say, I need you. I need your help. But Jesus even tells us how we can help him and what he wants, what he desires, and how we can be involved in what he's doing in the world. I mean, and if a true friend forgives, Jesus forgives. When you and I sin, we sin against each other, we sin against ourselves, but ultimately we are sinning against Jesus. And every time we do, Jesus says, I'll cover that one. I'll I'll forgive that one. I'll overlook that offense. I'll forget about it as far as the east is from the west. I've I've paid for that one. And over and over again, you will never know a friend so forgiving. So as you and I experience the friendship with Jesus, we'll be discipled in how to be a good friend. So if you leave with something today, don't leave with a list of seven things you need to do to be a good friend. Leave with, man, I have to pursue my best friend, Jesus who didn't call me servant, but said, from now on, I call you friends. 
So how do you pursue a friendship with Jesus? I mean, practically, you can't see him. It's actually not that different than any other friendship. It takes time. No friendship grows overnight. It takes time. And as you spend time with that person, there's discovery. So you discover who Jesus is by learning about his life. You discover who he is by looking at how he's working in in his church, in the world. You share more of who you are with him. A friendship takes intentionality. So what you talk to your friend about, talk to Jesus about. And if you look at almost all friendships have common interests. So what is Jesus passionate about? Join him in those things and you'll find your friendship with Jesus goes deeper. And as we experience Jesus as a friend, we'll find we're becoming a better friend to those around us. Our friendship circles will get bigger, but even more importantly, they'll go deeper because we've been discipled by Jesus. Let me pray for us. God, it's amazing that we can actually be called your friend. That Jesus would look at each one of us and say, I want you as my friend. Lord, that sort of intimacy with you, it it humbles us. Because we know we don't deserve that. We look at this list of a true friend and we know we've fallen short in every single way. Thank you that you pursued us, you died for us, you drew us to yourself. And Lord, I pray you'd help us experience uh, a relationship with you afresh uh, today, this week, uh, that as we enjoy our relationship with you, that we'd be able to give that sort of true friendship to others. And Lord, would our church be a place of deep friendship? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Why, if you're able to stand, sing together.
Praising God for eternity that we can call him friend. And none of us walks out of here with an empty circle. We have a true friend. So let's experience life with him. Now as we go, we'll say our benediction. And when we say the line according to, or they can do more, immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. I want you to uh, try not only to think, this is going to be hard, but don't only think about the Cleveland Cavaliers when you say that, okay? <laughs> all right, let's say our benediction. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Go in his grace. Happy Father's Day.